Thank you. Thank you very much and good afternoon everyone. Welcome to our today's event on a very important and relevant topic. The future of our continent, Europe. We are very excited to have you all here and we welcome all and especially our guests tonight, Mr. Benoit Curie and the moderator Hans-Jürgen Jacobs. A big applause. Thank you. <clears throat> This year, we are celebrating the first anniversary of the partnership between Ashes Deba and Tomb Speaker Series. This is the second event that we host together, and I would like to say that it's a real pleasure to be here in Munich uh, to co-organize such an event. Before Professor Henkel is now going to deliver an official welcome address on behalf of Tomb President Hermann, uh, I would like to give you a brief overview about the agenda tonight. After his speech, we will have short introductory remarks from Mr. Benoit Curie, and then we will start the panel discussion, which will be moderated from Hans-Jürgen Jacobs between three students and Mr. Benoit Curie. So the three students are Leonie from Tomb Speakers series, uh, who will represent the German view. We have also Philip from Munich Debating Society, who will represent the Eurosceptical view. <laughs> And I from HEC Deba, and I will represent the French view. So finally, we want to invite you all after the event for a get-together in the room Immatriculationshalle, which is directly opposite of the building. And now it's your turn, Mr. Henkel. We welcome you on the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Welcome to Technical University of Munich. We're looking forward to a truly exciting and important evening. As the Dean of Research of Tum School of Management, it is a pleasure and an honor for me to welcome today's speaker and main guest, Professor Benoit Curie. Bonsoir et bienvenue à Munich et à Tum. Professor Curie has been a member of the Executive Board of the European Central Bank since 2012, where his main responsibilities are market operations, payment systems, and economic research, I learned. Very warm welcome also to Hans-Jürgen Jacobs, senior editor of Handelsblatt. Mr. Jacobs, you will be the moderator of this evening. Before your current position, you have worked for various important newspapers and magazines, including Der Spiegel and Süddeutsche. So we have the perfect cast on stage, including a group of very curious and well-prepared students, I'm sure. Tonight's event was organized by students, as you just heard, jointly by students from TUM School of Management, the TUM Business Club, and by students from HEC in Paris, what they call the Commerce, <coughs> HEC Débat. This is a really fantastic initiative, both to invite such excellent guests and to do it jointly in a French-German cooperation. Thank you so much for the students, and I think the student teams deserve a hand. Thank you. The topic tonight is Europe. For most of us, and I, or for me, and I assume for most of us, Europe is a very positive idea. For me personally, collaborating with, idea, uh, with colleagues across the continent it's just a very enjoyable part of normal life. So I was shocked and personally saddened by the Brexit vote. The advantages of the European Union may not be equally distributed, and they may not be equally visible for everyone. Still, I am certain that they far outweigh the drawbacks. I had the opportunity to spend a research sabbatical in Singapore. And seen from there, every European country is pretty small and more or less irrelevant. The European Union is not. So I think that a strong European Union is more important than ever. With that, I invite our main speaker tonight, Monsieur Curie, 
on stage. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. So dear Dean, dear students, good afternoon. I'm absolutely delighted to be here in this wonderful room. Um, I see you're already messing up my name, but uh, it's okay. <laughs> there are too many voyals, I guess. Um, <clears throat> I'm absolutely delighted to be uh, invited here to uh, discuss Europe. I think it's uh, more important than ever to uh, to have that kind of discussions on what Europe has brought to us and what, can, what it can still bring us uh, in the future at a time where there are so many challenges uh, facing Europe. Um, and before uh, we start that discussion, I would like to share a few thoughts uh, on um, Europe's uh, economic and political challenges. From the standpoint of a European institution, uh, the European Central Bank, um, from a, uh, the standpoint of a, uh, of a um, institution at the center of Europe, based in Frankfurt, but uh, uh, interacting with all uh, other European institutions and interacting with all kinds of people throughout Europe, uh, at least throughout the 19 countries which are part of uh, the uh, Euro. Um, and let me start, um, <coughs> and I won't be long, so don't worry about that. But let me start with a recent political uh, development uh, in the US and, and also in the UK, which we've seen uh, since the summer. Uh, these developments have been widely uh, interpreted as uh, reflecting concerns about globalization and also um, skepticism about international cooperation. Uh, and to be fair, many Europeans also regard the responses to cross-border challenges, such as economic fragilities, migration, uh, terrorism, as uh, unsatisfactory. Um, a broad debate is underway about the European Union, about its raison d'etre and about its future. And that debate res resonates particularly strongly as we speak in November 2016, as we approach the uh, 60th anniversary, 60 60th anniversary uh, of the Treaty of Rome, which founded the uh, European Community, and also the um, 25th anniversary of the Treaty of Maastricht, with, uh, which established the Euro. Um, so the question is, how can we be confident that working together as Europeans uh, is still the best way forward? If you look back, I mentioned uh, the uh, Treaty of Rome in 1957. So if you look back at uh, the way Europe has evolved since 1957, uh, one, uh, one very simple way to sum summarize the whole project and the whole history uh, of the European Union um, is to... Um, is to describe participation in the European project as based on three promises. The first promise was for the post-war generation uh, the uh, guarantee of peace and prosperity and democracy. And that was the first promise, the post-war uh, promise that Europe made to, his, uh, to its people. And then came the fall of the Berlin, of the Berlin Wall. And for all Europeans who witnessed in their youth uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall, well, you're probably not part of them, but I'm part of them, uh, and that was so important for us. And Europe at that time held out the promise of freedom, um, the promise of freedom of movement um, from east to west, but also from west to east, uh, and the promise of better life chances for all those who uh, lived uh, east of the, uh, of the uh, Iron Curtain. And that was the second promise. And the third promise in the 90s and in the years 2000 was about globalization. And it was a promise to European workers which were hit by technological change and global competition to provide them with economic security and to, pro to provide them with protection against all shocks coming from globalization. Now, if you look back, um, I think it's fair to say that the first two promises have been fulfilled, the promise of peace, the promise of freedom, and they've generated strong support for the European project. But many do consider that the third promise, which is bringing people security and protection in globalization, has not been kept. Uh, and the best example is that Europe has suffered uh, from the worst economic crisis since uh, 1929, which partly originated outside of Europe, but is partly and largely, I would say, uh, of its own making. 
Next summer will be 10 years since the crisis erupted in, the, in August 2007. Many people of your age uh, have uh, felt the effect of the crisis to a disproportionate degree with the high levels of uh, youth unemployment uh, in many member states. Large numbers of young people feel economic and socially marginalized. And for them, uh, the national and the European responses have not been sufficient. And the emergence of a lost generation in Europe would be morally unacceptable and it would affect Europeans' prosperity uh, in a very persistent way, also economically, in terms of uh, the uh, uh, destruction of human capital, loss of energy, loss of projects that this would bring. So, the question is, where do we stand in, with Europe? Uh, how can we prove in a convincing way that the raison d'etre of Europe remains strong? How do we make it stronger? Um, and um, for this, as a central banker, uh, a member of the ECB, I have to focus on the economic dimension, obviously. I'm not a politician, so I'm not going to delve too much into the political ramifications of the discussion. Uh, but the political dimension still matters. Uh, it matters insofar as it uh, influences economic outcomes, which is very much the case today. So let's start with a word on the benefits of European integration. When President Obama was in Berlin last uh, Friday, uh, he said, and here I quote, at a time when the European project is facing challenges, it is especially important to show the benefits of economic integration. And I guess that in, in uh, President Obama's words, this was not only about Europe, this was also about the rest of the world. And I certainly do believe that the way Europe addresses its challenges not only matters for us as Europeans, it, doesn't, it does not only matter for our own uh, economic prosperity, it also holds lessons for the rest of the world. And when you look at the way European integration has worked, it has translated European values into uh, tangible benefits. EU citizens today have the right to live, to work, to study, to do business anywhere in the Union. They enjoy equal judicial protection, which is guaranteed by European courts. Um, the, the, the single market is not only about economic efficiency, it's also about creating a free and open society under a common uh, rule of law. And today the EU is one of the biggest economic blocs in the world, uh, at, at par roughly uh, with the U US and China, when you look at it in, uh, in, uh, in purchasing power parity. This will not last forever. Um, and at a time where regional powers are increasingly assertive on the global stage, at a time where emerging market economies are uh, rising fastly, uh, the single market and the single currency are essential assets uh, which we can leverage. Um, they uh, enhance uh, the, the significance and the influence of Europe uh, worldwide. But beyond its economic benefits, the euro also forges political bonds, uh, which have been repeatedly underestimated, not least by observers outside of Europe. Repeatedly, observers uh, outside of Europe, including very prominent uh, US academics, for instance, have predicted the end of the euro, and the euro is still there, and it's still uh, supported. And by the way, po popular support for the euro has remained high throughout the crisis. Support for EU institutions has weakened, if you look at the uh, Eurobarometer, for instance, which is a survey collected by the European Commission, uh, support for European institutions is low, for all European institutions, but support for the euro has remained high. Uh, so that's from the evidence that the euro has created political bonds that are very lasting and very resilient, that have resisted very well to the crisis. Uh, and in a sense, the crisis has um, put this political bond it has put those ties uh, to a test, uh, and as a result, the, the commitment, the political commitment to the euro and to the integrity of the eurozone has been strongly reaffirmed. Look at last year. Uh, in July last year, 19 uh, European leaders met uh, for one full night in, uh, in Brussels on Greece, and when they entered the room, it was not for sure in their, in their minds that Greece would stay in the euro. When they left the room, that was 5 a.m. in the morning, they reaffirmed uh, the, the future of Greece in the euro, provided that Greece would do reforms, etc. We can discuss it later. Uh, so it's, it's a, it's a reassertion, reaffirmation uh, of uh, the, uh, the future of the euro and the integrity of the euro in face of a very uh, uh, demanding and, and violent crisis. Um, so the crisis has showed that when Europeans act together, they are stronger. But also the crisis has uh, created uncertainty. 
And when uncertainty has the upper hand, attention turns inward to national fragilities. Uh, the crisis has also fueled economic selfishness, and it has accentuated financial fragmentation. So that's where we are now, at the, uh, emerging from this, from this crisis. So as I said, when we act together in Europe, we can be stronger. Monetary policy is an example. Monetary policy is done by the ECB, the European Central Bank, as a single institution operating on behalf of 19 European countries. Monetary policy decisions have played a key role in stabilizing uh, the economy in Europe uh, after the crisis by uh, deploying a, a wide range of conventional and non-conventional measures. Uh, we've avoided deflation in the Eurozone, we've reduced financial fragmentation, and we've supported the recovery. And we've done it within the mandate given to us by the people of Europe, which is price stability, which is enshrined in the Maastricht Treaty. And we've done it in a way which is fully accountable to the European Parliament. And as we, as we speak, by the way, the president of the ECB, Mario Draghi, is speaking uh, in front of the European Parliament, and he's being uh, quizzed by uh, European MPs uh, on the same issues. Uh, and we've also done it in a way which is fully accountable to the European Court of Justice, uh, which, has, which had the opportunity opportunity to rule on our decisions. Um, so monetary policy is an example of, a, uh, of, a, of an instance where Europeans have joined their forces, they've delegated one essential part of sovereignty, which is uh, money, to a single institution, but, and that's very important, they've given this institution the uh, capacity to act. The way we decide things in the ECB is uh, in the governing council of the ECB, which meets uh, every other week, and roughly every month, every six weeks, to take monetary policy decisions. The, the governing council of the ECB is made of the 19 uh, governors or presidents of the national central banks, plus a six-member board uh, full-time in Frankfurt. So that's 25 people, and we vote by a simple majority, and we take decisions. So you may like our decisions, you may not like our decisions, and there are discussions, and it's good that there are such discussions, but when we have to act, we act, we vote, we act, we move on, and we implement our decisions, and we have full authority to do so within our narrow uh, remit. So it's an example of a policy which is effective uh, because there has been delegation to a clear institution, but with a clear mandate. But monetary policy alone cannot achieve sustainable growth. It has to be complemented by uh, economic policy. It has to be complemented where available, where possible, by uh, fiscal policy both at national level and at European level. And we also need to better organize our interdependencies. First, we should not ignore economic and financial connections when we consider national policies. Under the treaty, the EU treaties, member states have a duty to regard their economic policies as a matter of common concern and to coordinate them. So a few months ago, the prime minister of a, uh, a leading European country uh, said, I'm not accountable to uh, Europe, I'm accountable to my national parliament. That is wrong. It is wrong le legally, first, to start with. It is wrong economically, uh, because our economies are, are so interconnected that whatever you decide, uh, you have also to care for the consequences on your neighbor. And you can hold your neighbor accountable for uh, what uh, uh, they are deciding. <clears throat> so that's the first message. Uh, uh, account for interconnections. Second, the crisis has shown that common institutions can help respond to the crisis. That's what we've done with our instruments. And also that common institutions have, uh, can help prevent uh, crises in the first place uh, by uh, avoiding excessive risk-taking. Uh, important measures to strengthen the financial architecture of, mon of the Economic and Monetary Union have been adopted throughout the crisis. The creation of the European Stability Mechanism, the launch of Banking Union, um, which uh, centralizes uh, the supervision of the largest banks uh, and also centralizes the resolution of the largest banks. So supervision is in Frankfurt, resolution is in Brussels, uh, and that is now single. And these were ess essential steps to uh, safeguard financial stability. And as a result, I'm, I feel confident to say that the monetary union is much more resilient today uh, than it was at the peak of the crisis in 2012 but there are institutional shortcomings. So we're only halfway there. We're only in the middle of the river. Um, maybe we see the other side of the river, but we're still in the middle of the river. Banking union has to be completed. What has been called by economists the doom loop between banking risk and sovereign risk 
meaning that uh, when banks are in a bad shape, uh, the, the sovereign, the, uh, the government can also uh, suffer and vice versa. Uh, so this uh, uh, fatal uh, embrace between banks and, uh, and, and governments remains to be broken. We've done some way towards breaking it, but not, not fully yet. Agreement on a European deposit insurance scheme, which would protect deposits throughout the Eurozone, <coughs> is not uh, within sight. It is being discussed, but it's not within sight. Uh, the single resolution fund uh, still lacks a common financial backstop. The banking supervision in the European Central Bank is doing a great job. Well, I can say that because I'm not part of it. I'm, uh, we have separation inside the ECB. <coughs> I'm sitting on the monetary policy side. I have colleagues doing bank supervision. They are doing, they are doing a great job. Uh, but, and and your, your area banks are much more resilient. But achieving a level playing field in banking supervision uh, which would be really at arm's length from national interests and from vested interests uh, will be a long journey uh, given the place we started from. And look at the fiscal rules. Fiscal rules, so the Stability and Growth Pact, for instance, they've been revised several times um, and they still have failed to build confidence in fiscal sustainability at national level. And building confidence in fiscal sustainability at national level is a prerequisite for any further move towards shared sovereignty, say, towards a, a fiscal union. You can't do that if you, if you don't have, in the first place, confidence in what governments are doing, and we still don't have that confidence. Um, and likewise, the rules aimed at uh, preventing macroeconomic imbalances uh, uh, remain uh, untested. Um, and finally, and that's my last example, I mentioned the creation of the European Stability Mechanism. It is a strong institution, it is an efficient institution, but the way the Eurozone um, solves its crisis, the, the, the crisis resolution arrangements um, are still mostly intergovernmental, meaning that you need an agreement uh, among all 19 ministers and maybe all 19 leaders before you get anywhere. It is very slow, it is costly, as the uh, protract protracted discussions on Greece last year have, have shown. So enshrining crisis resolution in union law, uh, bringing it under the oversight of the European Parliament uh, should remain a key, uh, key objective. So is that the priority? Well, not really. Uh, the, the focus of Europe, the focus of European leaders today is clearly not on uh, completing economic and monetary union. The focus of European leaders is on defense and security rather than on completing EMU. And that's for very good reasons. I mean, as a, as a European citizen, I'm glad that European leaders do focus on security, on defense, and on fighting terrorism, and on addressing the, the migrant crisis. They're absolutely right to do so. But Europe will not strengthen its capacity in these areas if it cannot rely on a strong economy uh, and on, on a more resilient monetary union. So it's all connected. And let me be clear, we should only embark on new projects if there is consensus that joint action is necessary, if it's clearly linked to the concerns of the European people, uh, and if it addresses a matter of uh, European relevance or global relevance. And when we do take joint action at, at European level, we need to be consistent. We need to complete the initiatives we've started. So the, uh, uh, the usual pattern is that we start a brand new project, fantastic new project, and then we leave it halfway and we move to something else. And half-built houses uh, are the most dangerous option. So, in particular, we cannot take competences away from the national level, from national governments, um, without empowering the union level, the European level, to, to provide at least as much protection for citizens as they had before. So if you decide to go that way, you, should, you, should, you have to go the full way. Um, and when responsibilities are clearly assigned to one level, either the national level or the uh, European level, then there needs to be a commensurate democratic accountability at that level. So anything that is assigned to the European level has to be uh, democratically accountable, and it has to be in particular accountable to the European Parliament. So let me conclude. Uh, policies always create winners and losers. And for this, it is acceptable at country level, because we have a sense of commonality at country level, which allows to decide on policies which make uh, winners and losers, and people understand why. For this to be acceptable at European level, we need to share a feeling of belonging together uh, as Europeans. One way to develop, to strengthen that feeling of belonging together, is to share tangible common goods that we can all relate to. So what first comes to mind is democracy. That's the first common good in Europe that comes to mind. The euro, which I mentioned, is another example. 
Um, so is the commitment to uh, protect our social model, to make our social model uh, sustainable. That's also a common value of Europe that we can adhere to. That brings us together and that shapes our identity uh, in the world. So thank you for your attention. I look forward to the discussion. So thank you very much for uh, this uh, remarks. We will now discuss for 45 minutes and afterwards you have the opportunity to give us your questions. Please ask everything you want. Perhaps if ECB is a good employer offering good resistible jobs, I don't know. Be open, be creative. So we start right now. I would like um, to enter into the discussion with the comments of the three students. If you hear uh, what Monsieur Corre uh, is uh, telling us, are you conv convinced? Um, how do you trust in the ECB as a major institution leading the way to a great European future? Well, yes, but of course we're all worried about the current situation since after the Brexit every country has to think itself is Europe the the union will want to be part of and yeah it, it is a great question at the moment and yeah I know that it's a hard job you're doing and I don't want to be in your position actually <laughs> so maybe you can it's a difficult position he is in <laughs> maybe, I think so maybe one day you'll be in my position you don't, you, you don't know you don't know maybe okay. and the others here what are you thinking? Is, is it an institution trustworthy? I think many people still believe in the UCB and many people are really, yeah, uh, I think that many people are really uh, happy with the UCB policies. But as you said, Mr. Curé, support for European institutions are low, but support for the euro is high. So the ECB is between the euro and between Europe institutions. So I think there is like an ambiguity on the position of European people on the ECB right now. Mm -hmm. What are you thinking, Philip? Well, uh, representing the euro skeptic and not necessarily myself, I'd like to point out two issues that some people have. Namely, the first one regarding to the um, claim of a mandate. Many people believe that the European Parliament is not democratic enough to represent them because um, it's one of the few parliaments that's not allowed to propose its own legislation. And correct me if I'm wrong, the members of the, Euro, um, of the executive board of the European Central Bank are appointed by the finance ministers of the various member states and I believe Mario Draghi is appointed by the um, European Council. Now, this is relatively removed from your common voter, so they believe that they don't have any democratic power, and as a result, they feel sort of left out. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, first, let me, support, let me come in support of the European Parliament, uh, out of <laughs> solidarity between European institutions, uh, also because I mean it. I mean, the, of course, everything can be improved. Anything can be improved, treaty after treaty, uh, the role of the parliament is improved. In the Lisbon Treaty, the parliament got much more uh, power uh, uh, at, at equality, at par with the council on many issues, which wasn't the case before, and that can still improve in the future. Uh, but they're doing it in a, uh, in a committed way. They can be quite harsh uh, when, they, uh, when they interact with uh, the European Commission or with us. Uh, they ask, uh, they ask uh, uh, deep questions. Um, and, by the way, I was uh, appointed by European leaders, but uh, uh, confirmed by the European Parliament. I had to go to the Econ Commission uh, and spend a two-hour uh, Q&A with them, and then there was a vote in the plenary parliament, and they, and they confirmed me. So, that's more democratic than many finance ministers in, uh, in countries which are just appointed by their uh, president, uh, and not uh, individually accountable to their parliaments. So, uh, there is accountability, uh, there, is a, uh, there is a dialogue, now, the European Parliament is not everything. So, uh, all European institutions have to improve also the way they talk to people, meaning their transparency, uh, their communication, 
At the ECB, we've taken steps to be more transparent, for instance. We are now publishing a summary of our uh, monetary policy discussions. We are publishing uh, all our meetings. Uh, whoever I meet in Frankfurt is on our website, so if I meet with a banker, uh, uh, he or she will be on the website so that people can, can check and can keep us in check. So we've got to be more accountable, I, I agree with that. You talked about slow development in, in Europe. What has to be happened? What, what is necessary? Where do we have uh, a big lack? Uh, which, which hurdles should be overcome? What do you think? How to, to make the development more faster? I would say the big, the big gap from, from the start is about, uh, is about um, coordination between governments and in particular coordination on fiscal policies. But we have so many commissions, yeah. so many councils in Europe. There's so much coordination. I'm not sure there is a lot of coordination, actually. Oh. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> <I'm not sure>. <laughs> <laughs> there, are lots, there are lots of meetings, which is a different matter. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, so, uh, coordination means it's not, a form, it's not a formality. It's not about meetings. Meetings, we have, we have enough supply of meetings. It's about when you go to meetings, being uh, truly and sincerely uh, committed to take into account what your neighbors will say, what your fellow ministers or fellow leaders will say. Um, and, and that's because uh, they are taking joint decisions. Uh, of course, it, it starts at home. So it starts with uh, having the right poli policies at home. That's why the discussion, say, on the Stability and Growth Pact is so important, because it's about trust. So you first need to trust your neighbor, that is he or she is doing the right thing. But then, once you trust him or her, you need to uh, take him or her seriously. Uh, that's the kind of process which can still be strengthened. Because otherwise, the ECB will remain alone, doing monetary policy without having a clear um, vision of what the economic policies surround, surround us. Mm -hmm. um, and that creates a gap. How do, you, do the others perceive uh, the European governance? Well, I think for us as students, it's really difficult to understand it in the whole thing. Who decides what? Mm. Where are the things decided? And it is really hard to understand, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think on the French side, for example, um, you know, uh, the constitution, the European constitution proposal of 2005 were rejected, was rejected by the French people. And one reason was um, uh, that the constitution to evolve needed the support of all the countries. It has to be, it, yeah, it had to be anonymous. And maybe that is, uh, maybe that's a reason of the slow development. Maybe that is the reason why uh, Europe is is developing, but developing very slow because it always needs needs the the, the support of each country. Mm -hmm. Philip. Uh, well, you mentioned in your speech that um, well decisions taken by national governments very frequently have effects on all of Europe or even the the entire world, and that as a result of that, these decisions should be taken by the European Union rather than the national parliaments. I think that's one of the main reasons why people really distrust furthering Europe, because basically they are being told that they need to abdicate national rights of self-governance to a, a union that they don't really understand. Well, I think you have a point here that um, it's not clear to people what the um, assignment of tasks between the national level and the European level and what's the rationale for it. So there are things that are decided at European level where you would expect them to be decided at national level and vice versa. So there is no clear assignment of tasks. So one, one in important project for the future would be to clarify what has to be done at national level, what has to be done at European level. But again, then, as I said in my remarks, you need to be consistent. So we have a single currency, the euro. So whatever is needed to make the euro work, to make the euro stable as a currency, has to be uh, at the eurozone level. That's why we have banking union. For uh, nearly 15 years, uh, there was a belief that we could have a single currency without having single bank supervision. That doesn't work, because money is created by banks, when you think about it. It's not created by the central bank, not, not, not mostly. It's mostly created by banks. So if banks are uh, supervised in a very fragmented way by different people in different places, then money is not single, uh, and you have an issue. So. That discussion is a, is, a, is a legitimate one, it's a relevant one, but my only plea would be to be consistent. So 
I, at, from an ECB standpoint, I would like to see at a Eurozone level whatever is needed to make the Euro stable. And the rest can be national, it can be EU28, EU27, there are different discussions. But whatever is needed to make the currency stable. And would it help if we have a, a minister uh, for finance in Europe, a, a budget minister responsible for all um, Eurozone countries? Would that be of great help? I think it can, it can, it's, not a, it's not a silver bullet because what matters is what he or her would be doing, actually, you know, in, in real mm -hmm. life. So it's a little bit of a political uh, gimmick, if you want, but it can help put a face uh, that the European people will know. We already have s somewhat like somebody who's acting like a European finance minister, who's uh, Mr. Dyson Bloom, who's the president of the Eurogroup. And he's doing, a very, he's doing an excellent job, he's mm -hmm. doing a great job, mm -hmm. uh, but he's not very well known by the European mm -hmm. citizens. So if that would help to create political uh, consistency and unity, why not? But then what matters is what he would be doing or she would be doing. Mm -hmm. Philip? Yes, I had another question about, um, about the role of the ECB in saving Greece after the crisis. So you said that the monetary policy and the bank supervision and such were separate. And my question is, couldn't one have saved Greece without them being in the Eurozone? Well, that was a discussion, obviously. Uh, and uh, to be clear, that was not a discussion that the ECB could be part of, because that's, uh, that's not for the ECB to decide who's, who belongs to the euro, who doesn't belong to the euro. That has to be a political decision. And clearly, in the spring and summer, early summer of 2015, last year, there was a discussion. Uh, some ministers took public views that uh, Greece would be better off, uh, at least temporarily, uh, outside of the euro. So it was a discussion, it was concluded that Greece would be better off in the euro. And the main reason, in my view, is first because of solidarity, because staying in the euro gives access to finance, it gives access to um, uh, liquidity provision by the, uh, by the ECB, it gives access to loans by the ESM, which outside of the eurozone you, you don't have. And another reason is that there are many reforms that Greece has to do anyway in, with or without the euro inside or outside of the euro. Greece had to reform their pension system. They had to reform uh, their labor markets. They had to reform their public finances. They had to reform tax collection. Uh, and this they would have to do anyway. So the euro just uh, provides a framework and it provides solidarity to, to help them doing it. Do you think the EU should be supportive in, in these points, in the, these reforms? Well, the EU is supportive in different ways. For instance, the, uh, the e European Stability Mechanism is uh, lending money to Greece. Um, the European Commission is providing technical assistance. Uh, and uh, of course, there are also structural funds and cohesion funds, which dates from before the crisis, which are also uh, available to Greece. So yeah, without, with outside of the uh, Euro and even more outside of the EU, uh, Greece would have been alone in doing things that they had to do anyway. If you're talking about fiscal policy, what does that mean? Are you thinking of, of a big investment program for European countries, especially for the southern countries? Or are you thinking of structural reforms inside the countries to have new laws, uh, more uh, liberal constitutions? What, what is your stance on that? Well, I don't want to be too. I don't want to go too far in. Uh, in yeah, you don't in, want to be. You know, in, in giving advice to governments. Uh, because when governments, uh, when finance ministers do give advice to us, we usually don't like it too much. So uh, <laughs> I think it would be fair you for us. You can do it another way. Yeah. It's fair for us not to uh, okay. go too far uh, in, uh, in, uh, into their backyards. So generally, what we want to see is something that um, that helps us do monetary policy, right? So something that improves the the efficiency, uh, the potency of our monetary policy. Fiscal policy can help. If it's, if it's in support of structural reforms, a lot of what we've had to deal with in the crisis was fragmentation, right? That any decision that we would take in Frankfurt would not have the same impact in country X or country Y, yeah. because country X uh, was um, um, facing uh, um, a lack of market access, facing mm. financial difficulties, etc. So reforms that can uh, rebalance uh, the Eurozone so that our monetary policy can be more effective are welcome. And if fiscal policy can uh, be in support of these reforms, say, by uh, providing more uh, investment, um, that's useful. Now, should that be public investment or um, 
tax incentives for private investments, that's not for us to say, and it clearly depends okay. from one country to another. What are the expectations of the students? He addressed the big youth uh, unemployment. What are your expectations? What should the politics do? I think politics have, uh, politicians have a great role in um, reducing youth unemployment. For example, we see that in France it has reached uh, high levels now compared to other big economies in uh, the European Union. And I think that uh, maybe more measures should be taken in the way of uh, contributing together to get a better employment rate in all Europe and not only in each country. I mean, it's a, it's a subject that we all are sensitized to, so uh, maybe we should, uh, yeah, favorize all uh, uh, reducing employment rates all around Europe and not just nationally. What do you think, Mr. Curry? Yeah, I, I think unemployment and labor market generally is, a, is, a, uh, is really a case in point. It's a good example of how different um, actions can be, uh, can be complement. Uh, if you want unemployment to go down, you need growth, right? Growth can be provided partly by the ECB, because whatever we do to... Our mandate is not about growth, it's about inflation. But whatever we do to bring inflation back to 2% will also create growth, mm -hmm. uh, and that can help. Uh, that, helps, that does help, actually, unemployment go down. Mm -hmm. Fiscal policy can help, also. Uh, but the truth is that in most uh, Eurozone countries today, fiscal policy is not, cannot be used because there is no space, because debt is so high. Uh, and then um, you, get lab you, you come to labor market reform. And when you look at the different un unemployment rates throughout the Eurozone, unemployment is declining uh, the fastest in countries that have done labor market reforms. So what makes a difference here is really the way you, uh, you reform your labor market. Uh, and you, you can see it in the numbers, in the unemployment numbers uh, and in the growth numbers. So I would say that it has to be a mix of everything, but uh, the uh, reform is probably the most important in that respect. Okay. But let's face reality. We have Brexit. We have the British people voting against the EU. Hmm? We have Donald Trump in the USA anti-globalization. Mm -hmm. We have Gerd Wilders in the Netherlands. He's leading the polls. We have Marine Le Pen, who might be president of France or not, but she is strong right in the moment. In Germany, we have AFD. Um, how big is the peril that this European idea we have shared for so many years is losing the people? So there are different issues in different places, so I wouldn't yeah, make a... Yeah, but it's all against integration. No. It's, yeah. it's all pro-nationalism. No, no, sure, but I wouldn't... I would use with caution examples coming from outside of the EU because there are different issues and different uh, uh, perceived uh, threats, etc. Uh, so let's, let, let's focus on the EU. And I'm not going to make political comments, as you can imagine. Yeah. ECB is not a political institution. Uh, but... Um, why are people attracted to uh, anti-European parties? Um, I'm not saying populist party. I don't know what's a populist party, so I, mean, uh, I, I couldn't draw the list of populist parties. But there are anti-European parties, right? People who want to take back competence uh, uh, to, uh, uh, away from Europe. Well, that's because Europe has not convinced people that it can deliver uh, jobs and growth. So uh, I guess the best answer is to create jobs and growth uh, because the proof of the pudding is in the eating. It's not a theoretical discussion, it's about creating growth. So it starts at home, it's about uh, national governments having the right policies to create jobs and to create growth. But we have to show, I mean, as a, as a collectively, we have to show that Europe does make a difference. I believe uh, that the ECB helps. Uh, everything we've done uh, uh, since, uh, throughout the crisis has helped sustain growth. It has helped avoid a, a, a recession, it has, or a triple dip, an, another recession. Mm -hmm. It has helped avoid deflation. So we've been part of that. There is not much more we can do about it. Uh, because if you want to sustain the, um, the long-term level of growth uh, in Europe, what economists call potential growth, that's not about monetary policy. That's about investment. That's about participation rate on the labor market. And that's about innovation. Which, which all is in the hands of governments and of social partners, businesses, mm -hmm. etc. So, if you want to convince people, you've got to, exp to, to show in a convincing way that European instruments can be used to create jobs. That's the only way. Mm -hmm. 
Leonie, what are you thinking? Is, is Europe on the brink? Are you worried that we won't have the euro perhaps in, in, in 10 years? Yes, I am. And especially since like countries like Greece or that there are enough that are high debts, how should they invest in, in new jobs and how should they do it if they, if they already have these debts? So that's a big problem. And of course, people in Germany are afraid too that yeah, well, we're going to lose the EU as the, the head institution. Philip, Europe on the brink? Is Europe on the brink? Is it on the brink? Is it uh, endangered? Is it in danger? That depends very much on which path it'll take next, I believe. If it, for example, tries to make life incredibly difficult for Britain for having left the common market and the European Union, then people will perceive the European Union as sort of a tyrant, justifiably. If they are nice to Britain and give them many concessions, then other nations will believe, well, then why are we staying in the European Union and paying into it in the, in the first case? So I'd say in mm -hmm. that regard, the European Union is, in, is in between a rock and a hard place and has to face very difficult choices. Both of them are probably wrong. What are you thinking, Skander? Is, is the bureaucracy in Brussels the biggest problem? I Many don't. people link that to, to the European uh, damage and to, uh, to the European problems, that there's so much bureaucracy in Brussels. Um, I think, of course, as you said, Mr. Carré, there is, there is a problem of complexity in European institutions. And the efforts of the European Union is making to more transparency, to explain to people a little bit yeah, more deeply how European Union functions. I think this is the heart of the problem. Yep. Today. But which leader is, is there existing right now telling the people more Europe, better institutions, the next step? Do you find any leader? Even, even Mrs. Merkel is quite shy about that point. Well, there is this, uh, there is this theory that Europe needs crisis to, uh, <laughs> to move on. And good uh, leaders. So there is a famous, a very famous sentence by Jean Monnet, which actually he never said, I guess. So it's uh, attributed to Jean Monnet that uh, Europe is the uh, is a sum of all answers um, provided to crisis. Mm -hmm. So Europe changes only in crisis, and it's a sum of all answers that have been provided through uh, successive crises. It's not. I mean, there is some truth to it. Uh, the last uh, big step in uh, European integration was in 2012, when a banking union was decided. That's an enormous step forward. It's an enormous transfer of sovereignty uh, because that's about the control of banks, which are the, uh, the, at the heart of our economic systems. Uh, and European leaders were brave enough to take that step uh, because they felt that it was needed for the, uh, for the uh, euro to, to, uh, to, uh, to work. And, they, and now we're doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, look at migrations. This is not my turf, obviously. But initiatives are being taken to strengthen uh, the uh, European uh, Coast Guard uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, um, uh, units uh, to, uh, to, uh, to find a, a, bet a better joint answer to migration. So they're not yet there, obviously, but they're working on it. So yes, we need crisis, but at some point also you need to, to stop and step back and ask yourself what you want to, to achieve in the future. Because all of this is a sum of short-term answers, right? Uh, everything we've done since 2010, 2012 was short-term mm -hmm. decisions. ESM, Banking Union, mm -hmm. we were on the brink, as you say, uh, uh, at the edge of the cliff, and we had to do something, and we did it. So it's probably time now to take a step back and for yeah. European people to ask themselves, what do we want, what, how do we want Europe to look like in 10 years, in 20 years? Because this hasn't been done for some time. So do you think that, well, if you want to create a vision that we should live as, I like that you say EU citizens, because I think no, no person in the nation, in, in the different countries would describe himself as EU citizen, but as German or French. So do you think maybe this would be the point to say, okay, in 50 years we should be the EU as the US and not French, uh, France, Germany and, and so on? Well, it's, n it's never going to be like the US because we have a different history. And remember that for the US to get where they are, they, need, they needed a war, right? Well, actually, several wars. First, external wars and then a, 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 a civil war uh, to get where they are. Also financially. So they needed a civil war. 
uh, to get to, to have a, a common budget, to have a common uh, central bank, etc. So we don't want to go through this the same kind of path, obviously. And of course, the Europe will never be like the US. Uh, it will always be a uh, some kind of federation of nation of nation states. I'm French. Mm. I, I'm working for a European institution. I'm forbidden to take instructions from my country. I'm, I, I have to think as a European. But personally, and in my history, I'm deeply French. I'm mm. not going to, to, to give up on that. Of course not. Mm -hmm. But I'm also a European citizen, and you're a European citizen. Uh, because you use, you use a single market every day, right? You're buying goods and services uh, produced in other European countries. For this to work, you need the European Commission to set technical rules, and you need the European Court of Justice to uh, decide uh, if you've been treated unfairly. Um, and that's about being a European citizen, because there is a, a rule of law at European level. And by the way, that's a, I mean, you mentioned, you mentioned Brexit. It's quite obvious that uh, when you leave the European Union, and if you don't want to abide by this rule of law, and to abide by common rules, and to be uh, accountable to the European Court of Justice, then you can't have access to the single market, because it is a political construction. It's not a pure economic construction. It is a political construction. But don't you think, Mr. Curie, that, uh, correctly, the, um, the differences, the cultural differences between all the countries may be a barrier on the long-term perspective? You know, I, 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 I fully and fundamentally disagree with you. Uh, I think cultural differences here are, are an, an asset. They are not a difficulty, they are an asset. Working at the ECB, my colleagues are German, Finn, uh, Portuguese, uh, Cypriot, Greeks. Uh, and it's a sum of all these different approaches that uh, make things work. Uh, it avoids uh, group thinking. Uh, it helps us find better solutions. Uh, and the, the fact that in the governing council, each and every decision, even tiny decisions like the ECB budget or collateral rules for this and that kind of assets, etc., all of this is discussed in committees with all uh, 19 members and participating central banks, and then it's decided by the governing council. And they come with different views. Uh, so we have a, a complex DNA, uh, which is a, a rich, uh, 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 hybridated DNA, and that makes us stronger. I think it really makes Europe stronger. And we are an example to the world, because we've been able to work as Europeans, uh, coming with, from different perspectives and bringing different cultures. And that's something that many other places in the world want to emulate. In Asia, they want to come closer to each other. They're looking at us. So we have to be a success not only for our own sake, but also to help these people outside uh, who wants to take the same route. Mm. Uh, what should be, should be done? We have uh, the development in the US with the big financial industry, and we have China with, with a new role model for economy. Mm -hmm. And in the Middle East, there's Europe. Um, in how far is it necessary that we have more integration? just to, uh, to compete with these two powers? I think we need, well, we do, we do have integration because we have a customs union, right? We have a single trade policy towards the US and towards China and towards many other places, which is good for political reasons uh, because it makes us stronger in international negotiations. So I wish good luck to any uh, EU country uh, uh, who would like to leave the EU and negotiate their own FTAs with uh, that many uh, mm. partners, uh, it will be much more difficult. Um, and they're not sure to be at the top of the, uh, uh, of the waiting line uh, when they start negotiating FTAs with our partners. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. And second, economically, it gives a, uh, the whole of the single market as a domestic basis for our companies. So when you're a... I've been in charge of uh, trade promotion in France in my former job, um, helping SMEs, French SMEs export to China. Well, the way you get to China when you're, a French, when you're a French SME, I'm quite sure it's the same for a German SME, is you first start selling locally, and then as a next step you sell to Germany or to Italy, mm. uh, and then when you feel familiar with all these different cultural differences, then you go to China or you go to, uh, uh, mm. or you go to, to India. So we, the single market is, uh, is a home basis for all our companies, and that's a big asset for them. Mm -hmm. Your question? What I would like to ask you, um, if, if you look at the, the people voting, voting against integration, against uh, inter international trade and so on, uh, you discover these are the voters from the countryside and these are the older ones. 
What are the implications for you as, as young people? Um, I think that this is a very difficult question for young people because uh, we have like a, a view of young people and I think it's, it's, uh, it's really difficult to have a view for all Europe. I mean, as Mr. Curry says, every, every country is different and I think many reasons explain why uh, these people are against integration and each country is different and I think we cannot just yeah, yeah. bring one, one explanation. Yeah, but I, maybe you're right that especially after the Trump elect and we don't know what he's gonna do, it, it is necessary to grow together in Europe maybe and this might also be a chance now but which actions can be taken for that? Do you have any any idea? To you mean to, to yeah to to yeah make sure that the integration is is bigger and to convince those people who elect AfD, for example, or who uh, would. That's, so let that me say the yeah. question for the story for the good European story, the, yeah. the narrative. Yeah. I think there are two things. I mean, there are much, much more than much more many than two things. But I think of two, two, two priorities in a sense. First one is to remind people what Europe brings them, which they don't see because mm -hmm. they are accustomed to it, but which they lose if the EU would not be there anymore. The single market is an example. Single market is boring, of course. Nobody cares about the single market. Only those in charge of making it work and. Uh, but then if you become a, uh, when you work in a company, it becomes very important that when you want to sell products to Poland or to Portugal, you don't need to go through the same paperwork and, uh, and red tape than if you want to sell to Argentina or to, uh, or to Morocco. Mm -hmm. uh, so it makes a difference in your daily life. So when you're a student, you don't see that because it's, it works well and you, uh, you see the, the products in the shops and you don't, you have to figure out all the value chain which is behind it. And, and the difference it makes for it to be in Europe rather than, you know, fragmented all around the world with tariffs and uh, regulations and everything. So that's, some, that's about making things visible. Uh, and the second thing is about um, openness. I mean, many people who uh, vote against Europe or who are uh, anxious about globalization, that's because they don't have contact with foreigners, mm. they don't have contact with uh, other cultures. So I'm not blaming. I mean, we're in democracies. Uh, it's it's uh, absolutely pointless to blame voters. I mean, it's, uh, it's it's not right to do that. But it's a fact that a lot of the anxiety is not necessarily related to economic losses, mm -hmm. direct economic losses, but it's more about not knowing, not having access to what the others are doing. So as, as young people, as students, you have the chance to be part of a... Um, to be in an environment where you can travel across countries, uh, where you, uh, you will study in different places, in different countries, inside Europe or outside Europe. And that's a fantastic asset. So my advice is make the best out of it. Uh, because once you're in your job track, in your career track, maybe you will lose that. So make the best of your student life to open to other cultures, also inside Europe, and then you understand why Europe is so valuable. Mm -hmm. Well, basically now we've just explained the advantages that we here have from the EU. But if we observe someone who does not have the privilege to attend a university and to take part in Erasmus programs, if we observe people who are not multilingual and can simply hop onto a jet to work in a different country, then the advantages that the EU has for them seem to be reduced drastically because all of these, all of these nice things just aren't for them. So one could claim that it's not only an issue of non-contact, but almost even envy, in a way, of the people, the perceived elite who benefit from this constru construct, versus the normal plebeians who are yet again being left, mm. left on the sidelines. But why don't you organize, organize yourselves? Why don't you go into the streets and, and rally and have manifestations like the people in, in 68 or 69? It's your future. You, you need Europe. You have to fight for it politically. Don't let the Wilders and all the others take over. So I think maybe this is also because we don't feel... Yes, but you have uh, to fight for it. I yes, think of course. Love is, love is not enough. Yeah. You have to, I think we're now in a situation that you have to fight, really. Yes, I think we're a generation who 
who just forgot about the problems you have if you don't act politically. But on the other hand, I also feel excluded somehow from politicians talking in a different political language. Like, I, they, they don't speak to me, and I, sometimes I don't even understand what they're saying if I, if I don't concentrate really hard. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. Skanda? I think it's pretty much the same feeling. I mean, okay. if you don't really understand politics in Europe, you can really appreciate all what has been made in Europe for now 60 years, so I think. No, but I, I mean, I, well, I don't know if you should go to the streets and shout, <laughs> but I, I won't pass a judgment on that. But I fully agree that you should fight for Europe. We're all fighting for Europe in different ways. I'm doing that in my job, which is about monetary policy. What we've done uh, since 2010 was about finding solutions to keep Europe together and to continue uh, providing stability to the euro, to the currency in spite of totally unprecedented new uh, uh, shocks which were coming, and we had to find uh, new things. And we were criticized from the outside, well, sometimes also from the inside, uh, by people who said, oh, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that, that might be dangerous, and maybe it will end badly, and we've never done that, uh, why should we do it? Well, because we had a duty to find solutions. And if we hadn't done that, then uh, the uh, economy uh, would have collapsed and uh, uh, deflation would have, uh, would have kicked in. So that's, that's my job. You don't have to do that kind of job. You. Uh, you will certainly do different things, but we all have to fight for Europe. Uh, and if we want Europe to stay, of course it has to change. I mean, institutions are not um, fixed forever. They're not frozen. Mm. So Europe has changed many times since 1957. It will change again. So it's just your job to decide what you want to make out of it. ECB has... Uh, done much. You have mm -hmm. mentioned that. You, you've mentioned also the good decision making, the good governance, and, and mm -hmm. all these things. You lowered the interest rates, you purchased bonds. Um, are you, is there still enough power or are you running out of gas? So looking, so. looking to the future, is, is there still enough power? Well, you know, we are doing what we have to do, so what we are doing now is exactly what, uh, what has to be done to, uh, to bring inflation back to 2%, which is our main objective. Um, we don't want it to last forever, clearly. Uh, so at some point, we'll start scaling it down. Uh, not yet, uh, because we are still, uh, we're still facing a situation where, uh, where inflation is very low uh, and not uh, increasing in a, uh, in a, uh, in a long-lasting way. But it certainly cannot last forever. Uh, the way we do monetary policy today is using extraordinary instruments, which you've mentioned, like negative rates, uh, which can be upsetting or uh, create anxiety because it's unprecedented, um, large-scale asset purchases, which have been done elsewhere, in the US, in the UK, in Japan, but it's the first time we're doing it here, um, long-term loans to uh, banks, uh, provided that they lend the money to, uh, to companies and to households. These are all new instruments. There is no, we don't intend to keep their to keep them forever. It will stay as long as needed. Uh, uh, and when we see inflation coming back to 2% in a sustainable way, uh, we'll start uh, winding it down. Will you buy also stocks? We don't have to do that. Uh, so uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not, uh, I don't want to discuss things that are not needed today. Uh, it has been done by some central banks, so it's in theory possible. Uh, I don't think there is a... I mean, we are far away from a, being in the place where we, we would need to do it. It has been done by the Bank of Japan, for instance, uh, mm -hmm. but it's clearly not in the discussion today. We never discussed it. Mm -hmm. What are you thinking about low interest rates, zero interest rates in this world? Do you think it will stay like that? Or if you look at US with, with Trump now, with his uh, big investment program he has announced, um, it seems to be that there will be more inflation. The, the interest rates may be going up uh, in December with the decision of uh, Mrs. Yellen. But what is your perception of, the, of this uh, state of economy? Well, again, it's something that affects different sorts of people in different ways. Those people who try to save money, they are severely disadvantaged by these policies. Those people who want to save to buy a house are disadvantaged because 
wealthier people are buying the houses and driving up the prices in order to have some sort of investment for themselves that gives them a, a secure return. So these are the things that the people actually perceive are happening. So they don't really recognize the possibility of growth in the abstract in the long run, but what they do notice is that the, that the numbers in their bank account are just getting less and less and less. Yeah, I think this is the great anxiety for people in Germany, especially, uh, for example, for people who, who are unemployed or people who stop working because they're, I don't know, 67, whatever. Um, they're afraid that the money they work for basically doesn't help them survive because it's... it's yeah, you know, if, if decreasing. when you're unemployed, I guess uh, your priority is to get a job, right? So what we're doing at the Unless ECB... Unless you're, you're, you get a pension already. <laughs> no, if you're unemployed, you get unemployment benefits, mm -hmm. but you want to get back to, to work, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so what we're doing at the ECB with the low rates and with the, uh, the uh, targeted lending to companies, etc., uh, is to support consumption and investment, which in turn creates jobs. And when it's not needed anymore, then uh, we'll unwind it, but, and then rates will be higher. But the main reason for what we're doing is that growth is very low, um, which creates unemployment in the first place. So the, uh, the best service you can provide, you can do to, um, to unemployed people is to, uh, to support growth. So at some point, so, so far the ECB is doing it, doing it a lot, and as I, said, uh, as I said, the best thing you can do in the long term is to, uh, to innovate, to invest, so that growth can be higher in the long term, and then rates will go up. So in a sense, the best way to support savers is to improve the return on capital in the economy, because ultimately that's what they get from their savings, right? If you invest in a pension fund, um, even in an if, if you have uh, uh, money in an insurance company, what they will get is investing in the economy, so that's the return that comes from investment. So the best thing to do to savers, to help savers, is to support uh, the return on capital in the economy. That's mostly about economic reforms and about innovation. How can okay, we still have 20 minutes left. I think now is the time to open the discussion for your questions from the audience. So, I say this is this guy here, the first one. Over there in that row here in the middle, we have microphones here. My other, yes. So I have a little feeling that we are focusing too much on France, Germany, and I wanted to bring the opinion of other countries like Portugal and Spain. I was traveling there last year and I spoke to a lot of people who were claiming the EU is the worst thing that has happened to them ever, and mainly the basic argument they were saying um, especially from the economically monetary point of view, was that by leaving the EU, they will have the possibility to implement inflation by themselves and that way stimulate growth. And as you said, as you said yourself, so my question is, what would you say to them why they should stay in the EU and why controlling inflation by themselves is not like... Thank you. Yeah. Well, first, we, we, we are caring a lot about, uh, about these countries, so it's not only about France, Germany, uh, Italy. Uh, we're working for all 19 countries. Uh, I, I'm, I'm traveling to all 19 countries all the time to talk to people, <coughs> and um, a lot of what we've been doing has been supportive of these countries. So starting from the ECB, it's not only about the ECB, but what, for instance, when we've uh, created these new lending facilities, uh, very cheap uh, loans to banks, provided that they use the money to lend, actually, to uh, companies and to households. This is mainly used in uh, Spain, in Italy, in Portugal, uh, in countries which have the most uh, suffered from the crisis. So our monetary policy is single, the instruments are the same, but they are most, some of, the, of these instruments are mostly used by uh, southern European countries, or countries hit by the crisis. Uh, and they have supported investment and consumption there. Uh, now, beyond that, I guess, first, they, it's, it's in their interest to stay in the euro because the euro provides stability, and when you're outside of the euro, 
um, you have to suffer from uh, uh, financial volatility, exchange rate volatility. You're alone uh, in a global economy and on, you're like a small boat on global financial markets which are rocking the boat all the time. Where you, when you're no, together uh, with, uh, with other European countries, uh, there is less volatility and there is more stability. Now, I come back with structural reforms once more because what we've seen before the crisis, before 2007, is too much money going into Spain, into Portugal, into uh, Greece, financing the wrong, the wrong kind of projects, that is buildings, real estate, instead of financing uh, investment in the economy. Mm. So we've also, we've, also, we've also got to improve the way the Eurozone works to make sure that the money, money goes to the right place and to make sure that um, risks are not being taken in the first place. And that's what the, the whole new framework in the Eurozone is about to make sure that uh, we are not going to, to, to create the same kind of imbalances that led to the crisis. Okay, next question. Here, second row. And then perhaps it's the lady here in the, the fifth row over there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I happen to agree that we have to make Europe sexy again. We have to remind people of this promise of peace and prosperity and the rule of law and freedom and so on. But my question is, how exactly can we achieve that, especially as the young generation? Is it more about communicating uh, to the voters and to the people, or is it more about structural reform, making uh, the European Parliament more democratic, giving it the power that most real parliaments have? Is it about um, restructuring the Council of the EU into a Senate? Is it about a common European army? What exactly are the means to achieve this goal most of us can agree on? Well, there is no easy answer to that. I think the, what Europe has to do is to to provide people what they need, right? Which is today economic security and security uh, to court, which is uh, uh, protecting people against terrorism, uh, protecting uh, people against uh, uh, um, uh, uh, instability, etc. So I guess the priority for Europe is to provide that, to build capacity in the field of security. That's not for the ECB, of obviously, to, to discuss or to decide. It's totally outside of our remit. But the point I'm making is, if you want to restart Europe, uh, you need to build trust in the fact that Europe can provide solutions to today's issues. So we are part of finding solutions to, economic, to the economic issues that people are facing. You also have to, face, uh, to provide solutions to, to the migration issue. You have to provide solutions to the security issue. Uh, and, and when this is done, then you can, pro you can transfer more sovereignty to the European level and, um, and pool, pool sovereignty at the European level. But it has to be the right sequence. You just can't ask today to people to vote for new treaties which would transfer additional sovereignty to the European level. Of course, this would not work. So the burden of proof is on us, European institutions, to do our job, to create jobs, to provide security. You, as young people, as European citizens, you have to hold us accountable for that. So that may be surprising, but it's your job also to ask us what, what, what we're doing. And to ask the European Commission, ask the Parliament, ask the different European institutions, the European Investment Bank. Mm -hmm. And we have to answer. We have to provide answer. Um, and when, you, when we've convinced European citizens that we provide the right answers, then we can take a step forward in European construction, but not before. Okay. Now the lady at the side here in the fifth row. She needs a micro, yes. So uh, one of the aims of the ECB is to unify the monetary policy. And I was wondering why only the monetary policy, not the fiscal policy? Wouldn't we avoid many mistakes or the, uh, the crisis perhaps if we had uh, also unified the fiscal policy? I mean, so, sorry, I didn't get the question very well. Could Is you that repeat the, the question? Having a question? single fiscal policy or...? Yes, exactly. Yeah. A single currency, yeah. So, yeah, in theory, yes. But when people talk of fiscal union, so fiscal discussion on fiscal union is very fashionable among economists. Um, there are many, many papers being written on fiscal union. 
uh, also on uh, eurobonds, uh, common European debt, uh, common European uh, uh, unemployment insurance, and these kind of things. But it reminds me a little bit of the of the usual joke about economists. Know that uh, the uh, uh, the, uh, the story of the economist who finds this uh, uh, can on a beach and says, "Assume I, I would have a can opener, right?" So fiscal union can be a solution at the end of a process, but it's not going to come. Uh, by miracle from heaven. Fiscal, fiscal union is a political choice, so you need trust among countries, you need people to vote for it, you need it to be discussed by, Europe, by, by national parliaments before it comes into reality. So it cannot be the solution to today's problems, right? So yes, it, life would be easier also for us if there would be a fiscal union, but it's quite obvious that the conditions are not met today because there is not enough trust among European uh, EU uh, member states because fiscal situations are too different from each other. Uh, some countries have a, a small deficit, some countries have a large deficit, some countries have uh, low debt, some countries have a lot of debt. So you need some convergence, you need countries to be more uh, uh, like each other before uh, you can move to fiscal union. Mm -hmm. And then as, a, as an end point, I would, I would support it. But it has to be uh, supported by, uh, by actual convergence. And then the discussion can start. Okay. Do you Question think a, sorry. Do you think a um, more flexible um, way could be a solution that some countries coordinate more than others, cooperate more than others? The I'm truth, not, only the truth. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure because there is, I mean, I've been, you know, I'm, I'm French. I've been uh, trained and educated in the, um, in the spirit of uh, French-German friendship, which, which still very much matter, matters for me. Um, and when I was um, back in Paris, there were ideas like, let's have a common fiscal policy with Germany, let's, have a, let's uh, merge our seats at the um, uh, International Monetary Fund, and these kind of things. France and Germany. That sounds nice. And maybe it's, it's, it's uh, the way to get to it. But at the end, as ECB um, official, uh, being in charge of, single, of the single monetary policy, I want things to work within the whole of the Eurozone. So I would be very reluctant to see any initiative that would be for a sub part of the Eurozone, because then it would, left, it would leave some countries uh, on the side of the road. Uh, and we want the Euro to be the same everywhere. So, uh, fragmenting the Eurozone is not the way forward. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some question from this side here? Yes. You? No? Over? Yes. Okay, your turn. Um, thank you. Um, my question would be, the, your job is to stabilize a currency which is based on 19 very different economies. Um, there's the concept of the South and Northern Europe Euro. And what is your opinion on this topic? I think it's, it's, a, it's, 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 it's a terrible idea. Uh, it's a terrible idea because we would lose all the benefits of, uh, of uh, having put together all these 19 countries. <clears throat> and the Eurozone, don't forget that the single currency was created initially uh, in 1992 uh, as a support to the single market. And so the, the, the deep economic reason why we have a single currency is that the single market works better um, with a single currency because there is no financial instability and uh, there are no uh, viable exchange rates within the single market. Okay. So any initiative that would, uh, such as the one you mentioned, would just create fragmentation and it, we, you would lose the economic benefits and it would impact negatively also on the single market. Now, now here from the first row, are you asking the 500 euro question? <laughs> the micro here, over here, the first row. Micro here. Uh, most people still feel first French, uh, British or Spanish before being European and I believe that that's why they don't feel the solidarity uh, maybe towards other Europeans. And my question is therefore, do you think the European Union can still survive in its current state or does it have to be a federal republic as would be the United States? Because there would still be a permanent hostility of people uh, not identifying with other Europeans, but just with their own uh, countrymen. No, I, I don't think the uh, European Union has to be like a federal state. I mean, we had this, we had this discussion earlier. It's a different model. 
uh, it's a different experience. We just have to put together in the same place what is needed to make it work. It doesn't have to be everything. Um, so we don't need to go the, uh, uh, down the, the same road as the US, I don't think so. Okay. As everyone here likes uh, the 500 uh, euro bills, I ask you a question. Why ha have they to be removed? What, what an idea. We all love, love them. Please keep them. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so it's nice to see all these students who have uh, 500 euro bills in their pockets. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a great, that's a great university to be. <laughs> um, we are not removing the 500 euro banknotes. We, ah. we, we, we are stopping producing it, mm -hmm. right? We are not removing it. So any, uh, I mean, that's a very serious issue because that's about trust in, in banknotes. So any, every 500 euro banknote you have will keep its value. Uh, you can still use it. Um, there is no plan to withdraw 500 euro banknotes, right? We're just stopping the production and we'll issue as many 200 euro banknotes as needed to, uh, uh, to make for it, to, uh, to, to replay them. And uh, the reason we had long discussions uh, in the Governing Council and the reason is that we have compelling evidence that the 500 euro banknote uh, is, a, uh, is an important vehicle for, uh, for money laundering and for, for fraudulent activities. So we are part of a, uh, of, a, of, a, of a more global project which also involves finance ministers. Uh, it's mm. not popular, I agree with that, like limiting cash you know, the amount you can pay in cash, mm. uh, which the German government is doing. Mm. Um, that's not popular, but it's a way to, uh, to avoid fraud. Uh, and we were convinced that we had to do it for the 500 euro banknote. We don't want, as, as Central Bank, as a Central Bank of 19 countries, we're not taking a view on what will be the future of cash, right? There are countries, like Sweden. In Sweden, mm. banknotes are Only disappearing cash, yeah. very, very quickly. And they can see the point where there will be no banknotes at all, whatsoever. Everything will be uh, dig digital money. We're not there because there are different approaches in the uh, Eurozone, there are different uh, ways to use cash, and that has to be decided by people. So we don't have a normative view on uh, how people want to uh, pay for things, and we respect the argument that um, it's also about privacy, and if you move 100% to electronic money, then maybe there are issues with privacy, uh, data protection, uh, that you don't have with banknotes. So you have to balance all these issues, um, but for the moment, the decision on the 500 euro was really related to, uh, to okay. fraud and money, money laundering. Thank you. So one last question. One last question. Over there, yes. Oh, wow. But you don't want to give us a speech, or with your shit oh, of no, paper? No, there? no, no. But just one question. So, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Bonsoir, <laughs> with Monsieur Curie. Curie. Thank you for coming here. So, we were talking about the uprise of the populist movement in the Western world. In the U.S., we have Donald Trump as president-elect, and here in Europe, we have parties like the Front National and the German AfD. They get stronger and stronger. I don't think that the gaining of power of these populist movements are only reasoned by a growing nationalism, but also by a growing mistrust in the political establishment uh, as being too strongly linked to banks, elites, etc. So for example, Hillary Clinton gave speech to Wall Street bankers, Draghi used to work for Goldman Sachs, Barroso now works for Goldman Sachs, and so on. Also, you were criticized for being connected to hedge fund managers by the press. How do you see your personal... Sorry, is this a declaration or I, no, I no, just giving us a question? How do you see your personal responsibility in giving the people of Europe trust in the executives uh, during and after your job? Thank you. Well, I guess the point you're making is that you've, we've got to listen to people and to understand why they're voting for, uh, for uh, uh, anti-European parties. I think we've got to take that seriously. And we've got to understand what, is, what, is, what has gone wrong, uh, and then we've got to fix it. So as I said, um, the ECB tries to be part of the solution by uh, creating growth, which creates jobs uh, in, uh, in all 19 countries. Uh, we are part of the economic part of that solution. We also have to 
think harder about what went wrong with globalization, which is part also of the, uh, I guess, of, the, uh, of that story. Um, it's probably the case that uh, we uh, went too far or in a, maybe in, a, in an unregulated way into financial globalization, which has uh, impacted the way we do uh, trade with each other. We, you look, you, in, any, in, any, in, a, in a trade 101, in any economic course, you learn that trade is good, but it creates winners and losers, right? So it's, it's un uncontroversially good only if you can um, take part of the money that is earned by the winners and give it to the losers. That's what you learn in trade uh, courses. The fact is that financial globalization has, uh, in a sense, impaired uh, the instruments that allowed governments to do it. Uh, the first instrument being taxes because taxes are not being paid or are being paid in, a, uh, in an optimized way by, uh, mm -hmm. by large uh, global companies. So regaining control on taxation, which the European Commission is doing, which the G20 is doing, uh, is part also uh, of a project to better regulate globalization so that it can benefit uh, also the losers and not only the winners. So that's, that's only an example. But we've got to listen carefully to what people are saying and then we've got to provide solutions for sure. That's okay, the answer for you? Perfect. Okay, I think we come to an end right now. We have discussed now one and a half hour. You give us a speech. Thank you very much for this great. You have want to have a final remark? No, my, my final word, which is very very first. Thank, thanks a lot for coming. Uh, and second, uh, you know, Europe is not. Um, Europe has to change. Europe will change. So the future of Europe is in your hands. So make up your mind. Uh, you have to form a view of what, where you want Europe to go, and then say it. Thank you. So, thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. Have a good night. Thank you. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. So, Thank you before much. everyone's leaving just yet, Thank we you. have a few announcements to make. Um, first of all, our next event will be a talk with the CIO of Evonik Industries, which is going to be one week from now, in the room 2300, starting at 7 p.m. Furthermore, we would like to invite you to a reception with beer and some snacks, just on the other side of the road in the matriculation hall. Also at 8 p.m., there will be an event by the TUM, which uh, will talk between music and mathematics. And the last thing is that the Munich Debate Club, our partner, has a few things to say, and maybe you could listen to them and hear what they have to say. Now, thank you for your time and for your discussion. A few gifts for you, please.